Our first lesson, you remember, dealt generally with the humanities, what they are and what they do. We learned that the humanities deal with the ideas and feelings that govern men's minds, with the basic questions about life that all men ask themselves, and with some of the answers to these questions. Well, we learned also that great books are part of the humanities, and that music, architecture, painting, sculpture, the dance, even photography, are all part of the humanities. Now, in this lesson, we'll take a closer look at one subdivision of the humanities and see how it works. We'll discuss plays, or the theater, or the drama. They're all names for one thing. What is a play? Now, before we answer that question, I want you to look at some pictures. These newsreel shots were taken at a game between Army and Columbia. These are pictures of a very different kind of spectacle, a much more important one. It's a high school commencement. This is a spectacle far more important than the high school commencement the ceremonies accompanying the inauguration of President Roosevelt on March 4, 1933. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will to the best of my ability... Now, what have these three scenes to do with our discussion of the theater? Have you ever thought of a football game or a commencement exercise or a solemn ceremony like a presidential inauguration as a kind of play or drama? Well, in all three of them, there are actors, people performing an action, aren't there? And there's an audience, isn't that true? And in all three of them, certain emotions are aroused in the audience by what the actors do or say. In all three of them, the audience identifies itself, feels a special sympathy for one or more of the actors. In a football game, you root for your team. If you're a parent, you're moved perhaps almost to tears when your son or daughter receives the diploma. And the whole nation prays for the new president. In all these respects, the three events resemble a play in the theater. But they resemble it in still another way. All three events proceed according to rules. The football game would be bedlam without its rules, its penalties, its strict adherence to a time schedule. And the commencement proceeds according to certain set rules, too. And so does the inauguration. Now, these rules, these agreed-upon conventions, help to make these events interesting, because from these rules, the events derive their form and even their beauty. The president doesn't merely casually promise to serve his country well. He must swear it on the Bible. Now, what I'm trying to make you see is how the human instinct for creating a drama out of what might otherwise be an ordinary happening, how this instinct is at work constantly and in a hundred ways. We're not satisfied with raw experience. We dress it up, we decorate it, we impose rules on it. In other words, we try to make out of what could be an ordinary happening, like graduating from high school, something approaching a work of art. Now, like the football game, and the commencement exercise, and the inauguration, a play is a way of presenting an action to an audience. A play is a way of telling them a story, or rather it's a way of acting out a story in front of them. Now, do we all know what acting out a story means? In order to make it vivid, let's try an experiment. First, I'll tell you a story, or rather an incident in a story. And then we'll have that same incident acted out by first-rate actors, so that you can see how the playwright transforms the incident into dramatic form. 
The incident is drawn from a story called Life with Father, written by Clarence Day. And the incident occurred in the late 1880s in the living room of the Day family. Father Day was a family tyrant, but his bark was worse than his bite. His wife, Vinnie, was a gentle, pretty woman who seemed very scatterbrained, but who usually managed, in the end, to make her husband do whatever she wanted. Among the many things that irritated Father Day was Vinnie's inability to keep her housekeeping accounts straight. One morning, they had an argument about six dollars that he'd given her to buy a new coffee pot with. The argument turned on what had happened to that six dollars. And somehow, Father Day never understood just how, he lost the argument and his wife won it. Well, that's a small part of the story which the playwrights Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss took and transformed into a play called Life with Father. We're now going to see two actors act out in play form the incident that I've just told you. And as you watch it, note what a different thing it is from my narration. Vinny, mm -hmm. sit down. Oh, oh Vinny, Vinny. Vinny, you know I like to live well, and I want the family to live well. But this house must be run on a sound business basis. I must know how much money I'm spending and what for. Now, if you recall, a week ago, I gave you six dollars to buy a new coffee pot. That's because you broke the old one. You threw it right on the floor. I'm not talking about that. I'm merely endeavoring and to... And Claire, find... it was so silly of you to break that nice coffee pot. <laughs> there was nothing the matter with the coffee that morning. It was made just the same as always. It was not. It was made in the most barbaric manner. Besides, I can't get another imported one. That little shop isn't selling them. They say the tariff won't let them. And that's your fault, Claire. You're always voting to raise the tariff. The tariff protects America against cheap foreign labor. The tariff now, does I... nothing but raise the prices. And that's hard on everyone, especially the farmer. I wish you would not talk about things you know nothing about. I do, too, know about it, Claire. Miss Gulick says that every intelligent woman should have some opinion. Who, may I ask, is Miss Gulick? Why, Claire, you know. She's that kind of fence woman I told you about. And the tickets are a dollar every Tuesday. Do you mean to tell me that a pack of idle-minded women pay a dollar apiece to listen to another woman? Listen to me if you want to know anything about the events of the day. But, Claire, you get so excited. Besides, Miss Gulick says that our president, whom you're always belittling, Praise to God for guidance. Praise to God. You... Vinny, what happened to that six dollars? What six dollars? I gave you six dollars to buy a new coffee pot. Now, I find that you apparently got one at Lewis and Conger's and charged it. Ah, there's their bill. One coffee pot, five dollars. So you owe me a dollar and you can hand it right over. I will do nothing of the kind. What did you do with that six dollars? I can't tell you now, dear. Why didn't you ask me at the time? Oh, Lord. Well, now, wait a minute. I spent $4.50 for that new umbrella I told you I wanted, and you said I didn't need, but I did ah, very now much. Now, we're getting somewhere. Now, one umbrella, $4.50. And there must have been the time that I paid Mrs. Tobin for the two extra days washing. Mrs. Tobin. Two dollars. Two dollars. That makes six dollars and fifty cents. That's another fifty cents you owe me. I don't owe you a thing. What you owe me is an explanation of where my money's gone to. Now, we are going over this account book item by item. I do the best I can to keep expenses down. And you know yourself that Cousin Phoebe spends twice as much as we do. Blast Cousin Phoebe. I've no wish to be told how she throws our money around. Claire, how can you? I thought you were so fond of Cousin Phoebe. I am fond of Cousin Phoebe, but I can do without hearing so much about her. Well, you talk about your relatives enough. That's not fair, Vinnie. 
When I talk of my relatives, I criticize them. But if I can't even speak of Cousin Phoebe... You can speak of her all you want to, but I won't have Cousin Phoebe or anybody else dictating to me how to run my house. I never said no. a word about her dictating. Well, but you said... Oh, you... Claire, she's not that kind. But... Well, I... Uh, I swear I don't know what you said now. You will not stick to the point. I endeavor to show you how to run this house on a business basis, and you always wind up gibbering and jabbering about everything else under the sun. Now, there is a small matter here of some $32. But I don't know what you expect of me. I tie myself out running up and down those stairs, trying to look after your comfort, to bring up our children. I do the mending and the marketing, and on top of all that, you expect me to be an expert bookkeeper as well. Uh, Vinnie. Uh, uh, Vinny, uh, Vinny, I have no wish to be unreasonable, but don't you understand I'm doing this for your good? Uh, uh, well, I, I suppose I must just go on paying the bills and hoping there's enough money in the bank to meet them. But it's all very discouraging. I'll try to do better, Claire. Well, that's all I ask. I'll just go downstairs and make out the checks and <clears throat> sign them. Let's see now whether we can list at least two ways in which a play, like the one from which we drew that scene, differs from a simple narration, such as my summary of that same scene. First, I told the story in the past tense, didn't I? I told you what had happened. But the playwright shows the thing happening. On the stage, it is always now, as one playwright put it. Second. I told you about the characters. The playwright shows you the characters in action. They reveal themselves by what they say and do. The playwright Thornton Wilder, whom we shall study in this course, says that the theater is the most immediate way in which a human being can share with another the sense of what it means to be a human being. We may say then that the theater is an art using words and actions to give us direct experience. The experience may be tragic or comic, farcical or melodramatic, and there are different kinds of plays corresponding to these experiences. If they are successful plays, they all have certain things in common. They all turn on some kind of conflict. It may be a comic conflict, as in the scene that you've just watched, but conflict there must be. But it is not enough just to have conflict in a play. In addition, the people in conflict must be interesting. We must somehow become involved in their lives for the short period of the play's action. We must identify ourselves with the hero or hiss the villain or perhaps have more complicated relationships to the characters. The important thing is that though we may be technically spectators, we are actually in imagination on that stage. We are ourselves actors. Now, to give us this sense of involvement, a whole art has been devised, and this is the art of acting. It's merely a development of the art of make-believe, not, in essence, different from the impulse that makes us, when we're children, pretend we're spacemen or animals. To show you what I mean, Let's take a famous character from the plays of Shakespeare. The character is a man named Sir John Falstaff. Falstaff is a fat, bragging, roistering rascal. He has no morals and very little courage. But despite that, ever since he was first created more than 350 years ago, the world has watched him on the stage with delight. For all his faults, 
there's more life in this imaginary character than there is in most real people. Falstaff is the kind of fellow who thinks more of his own skin than he does of reputation or glory. At one point, Shakespeare shows him to us just before a great battle is about to begin, a battle in which he will have to take part. He isn't very happy about it, and he begins to wonder about honor, which makes men into courageous soldiers. He wonders whether it's worthwhile to lose your life in order to keep your honor, and decides very conveniently that honor is really meaningless. I'll read what he says. Well, tis no matter. Honor pricks me on. Yes, but how if honor prick me off when I come on? How then? Can honor set to a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Or take away the grief of a wound? No. Honor hath no skill in surgery then? No. What is honor? A word. What is that word, honor? What is that honor? Air. A trim reckoning. Who hath it? He that died a Wednesday. Doth he feel it? No. Doth he hear it? No. Tis insensible then. Yes, to the dead. But will it not live with the living? No. Why? Detraction will not suffer it. Therefore I'll none of it. Honor is a mere scutcheon. And so ends my catechism. Now, that wasn't acting because acting is the art of temporarily becoming someone else. And I don't have this art. Let's watch someone who does. This is the actor, Douglas Campbell, in his dressing room. By means of makeup, he will change his face into that of another person, Falstaff. Gradually, he's looking less and less like himself. And now he's ready to appear in the part of Falstaff on stage, ready to create the illusion for us that he is Falstaff. But how if honor prick me off when I come on? How then? Huh? Can honor sit to a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Or take away the grief of a wound? No. Huh? Honor hath no skill in surgery then? <laughs> no. What is honor? A word. What is that word honor? What is that honor? Air. A trim reckoning. Uh, who hath it? He that died a Wednesday. Uh, doth he feel it? No. Doth he hear it? No. Tis insensible then, yea, to the dead. <laughs> but it will not live with the living, no. Why? Detraction will not suffer it. Therefore, I'll none of it. Honor is a mere scutcheon, and so ends me catechism. That was a different experience from the one you got listening to me, wasn't it? Well, the difference is simple. Mr. Campbell is an actor, and I am not. And yet we both uttered exactly the same words, 
perhaps you didn't even understand all the words. But Mr. Campbell's art made you understand Falstaff and the situation Falstaff is in. Well, now we know two essential elements of the theater. First comes the playwright with his story and his words. Then comes the actor who brings these words to life. But there's still a third element. And that third element is you, the audience. Because a play doesn't exist by itself. It exists only when it makes something happen in your mind. And for that something to happen, you have to collaborate. I suppose one way of describing that collaboration is to say that you have to cooperate in being fooled. You have to be willing to be deceived. You have to help the actors delude you so that you can believe in what they're doing. And now let's take part of the scene from Life with Father all over again. But now be on the lookout for things that aren't really so, but that we're willing to believe anyway. Vinny, mm -hmm. sit down, please. Now, the first thing you're supposed to believe is that this is a room in Father Day's house. Uh, Vinny. Vinny. Vinny, you know I like to live well, and I want the family to live well. Of course, it isn't a real room at all. It's a set in a movie studio. One wall is missing altogether, and the others are made of painted flats, as they're called. But until you were reminded that it was actually a set, I'm sure you were quite willing to believe that it was a real room. And when you saw this scene the first time, you probably accepted as real a number of other things that happened. Let's watch carefully, and this time from a closer camera angle. We can see now that the actress was playing Vinnie almost Mr. Q. Notice the stage hand. Uh uh, there's supposed to be glass in that door. Looks as if Father's forgotten. The electric light hasn't been invented yet. Vinny. <laughs> phony pen and phony account book. As you can see, many of the things the actors did and many of the things they used on stage weren't real at all. Even their conversation in the earlier scene, which sounded just as if you and I were talking, is actually quite different from what you'd hear in real life. Just think of how much you already know about these two people after listening to them for just a few minutes. Do you think in a real life argument that you might overhear, you could learn so much so quickly? Not a chance. Well, what have the playwrights done? Two things, perhaps. One, they've carefully limited the dialogue to just those words that will create the characters in your mind quickly. Two, they, and the artistry of the actors, prevent you from noticing that that's what they've done. In other words, their language sounds natural and real because you accept as natural and real language and action that would probably not be duplicated in real life. Another thing, these characters are amusing, aren't they? What they say is funny. But in real life, people talking to each other are rarely as funny and self-revealing as Mr. and Mrs. Day seem to be. Play dialogue, then, is always more eloquent or witty or penetrating than real dialogue is. Now, I could point out other stage tricks of this nature, but I think you must have the idea by this time. All of these tricks are called 
dramatic conventions. They resemble the rules in that football game or the prescribed ceremonies of that commencement and that inaugural. A convention is something agreed upon. In this case, you, the audience, agree to believe that a stage is a room. That's the convention of place. You agree that a complicated story, which might take days or months or even years to live out in reality, can be represented in minutes or hours. That's the convention of time. You agree to believe that a character is doing something when he's really just pretending to do it. That's the convention of stage action. You agree to believe that people really can talk as revealingly as they do in this play. And that's the convention of dramatic language. Now, dramatic conventions differ with the periods in which the audience lived. You happen to have just seen a modern comedy using some of the conventions of our day. But if you'd been a Greek 2,500 years ago, let's say, and gone to the theater, you would have listened to actors speaking in poetry and wearing masks, and you would have accepted those conventions of language and costume. If you'd been a contemporary of Shakespeare, you wouldn't have been surprised to see a ghost appear on stage and take part in the action. That was another convention. Or if an actor came out and put down a small bush on stage, you'd have known that the scene represented a forest. To understand the theater of any other day than our own, you have to understand and accept the convention of that day. Our agreement to these conventions makes it possible for us to believe temporarily in the play. And once we believe it, it can affect us, move us to tears, to laughter, to awe, to fear, to understanding. It can fill our minds with imaginary characters and invented speeches. And curiously enough, these imaginary characters and invented speeches can actually have an effect often deep and permanent, on our real selves. It is this effect on us that makes great plays interesting and important. It is this effect on us that makes them part of the humanities. They help us to discover ourselves. And that's why they're worth studying. Now, all we've had time to do in this lesson is take a brief look at the theater, considered as one of the humanities. And we've considered the three main elements of any play. The play itself, the actors, the audience. Now we're ready to study in a little more detail a whole play. And that's what we'll do in the next two lessons.